Well, the story is told of a man who moved to a new city. For all intents and purposes, he had fallen on some hard times and his standard of living, looking from the outside in, had began to drop quite drastically and considerably. His clothing was gradually more and more torn, his face gradually more and more unwashed, his use of soap or deodorant was beginning to become non-existent to the point where the unpleasant odour which was exuding from him worsened with each passing day. Unsure where to turn to, not having many contacts in the new city, this man turned to the church. And he decides that he will find out where the big, the time that the biggest church in town was meeting. And his plan was that he would arrive just before the rush. That he would plant himself outside with a wee placard of cardboard and a used coffee cup. And he would beg for them to take mercy on him. Hearing that the Christians were generous people and they followed the teachings of a generous man who loved the poor and needy, this gentleman felt that the church were his best bet. So as Sunday came, he went down to the church just as he had planned. He arrived before everyone else. He got himself set up and planned and waited for the people. The first group arrived and hope filled the man's heart. This group, all dressed in their Sunday best, began to approach the steps of the church. But upon seeing the man, the husband grabbed the children and hurried them up the other side, whilst the wife gave a wry smile as she walked on by. Another group came, this time older couples, but the same story. Only this time the story had clutched handbags and grabbing of husband's hands extra tightly to ensure safety. And the story continued in the same vein but with different variables. And this Sunday was a particularly busy Sunday in the life of that church. You see inside the church there was this sense of expectation and excitement. You see, for the first time, this congregation would be meeting a new candidate for the ministry who had been approved by the denominational leaders to come and share with them that day. And it was hoped that if today went well, that a process would begin of the calling of that individual to be their pastor. So many in the pews were embarrassed by the man who sat on the steps outside. Many wondered what message that would send to the ministerial candidate about the area. After all, he had a young family and they didn't want him to be scared off by something which actually wasn't all that normal for them and hadn't actually happened until today. So as the service began, there was still no sign of the ministerial candidate. He couldn't be found anywhere, but everybody just assumed that he was in the building. Songs were sung, prayers were prayed, and then anxiously in the final chorus of the final song before the sermon would be preached, the leader looked around her, all worried that she would have to bring the message and she hadn't prepared anything in advance. However, with the last note of the song, the doors at the back flung open and in walked the man who had been sitting on the stairs. Up he walked, up the aisle. People caught in shock, unsure what to do. Continuing to walk, the further he got up the aisle, the deeper people gasped until he reached the top and finally stopped and turned to the congregation, removed his old tatty coat to reveal a freshly pressed suit from which of the pocket he produced a comb and combed his ragged hair over. 
lifted the Bible from the lectern at which he now stood and began to read from James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in, old, in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but to the poor man you say, you stand here or there or sit on the floor by my feet. If you do this, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The truth is, it's easy for us to make preconceptions about other people and about their circumstances. If you didn't get it from the story, the ministerial candidate who had not shown up was the very same man who had been sitting on the steps outside before the service began. Sometimes it's easy for us to make preconceptions about other people and about their circumstances. Other times, admittedly, there's no preconceptions at play at all because the very facts are also before us. Yet, in both cases, as the people of God, James, in no uncertain terms, tells us that it is sinful for us to show favouritism. It is sinful for us to exercise preference when it comes to people. And it is sinful to respect some individuals and not others. James himself reiterates here the consistent truth which is revealed to us throughout the scriptures. That it is contradictory, it is the opposite for us to profess Christ, to call ourselves followers of Jesus and yet show favouritism. We're told and shown in Acts 10, 34, in Romans 2, verse 11, in Galatians 2 and 6, in Ephesians 6 and verse 9, and indeed in other places, that God is no respecter of persons. That God himself, the creator of the universe, who knows the thoughts of every man and woman, who put the stars in their place, that he does not show favoritism and if God does not show favoritism neither should his people the reality is church that there is no place in the life of a Christian for snobbery have you ever met somebody who's a little bit snobby you know those people who look down their nose at you like you're dirt in the bottom of their shoe you ever come across somebody like that? If you're really honest, as you reflect on your own lives, have you ever been guilty of doing that to somebody else? And it's not until you walk away from the situation and you look back and you're like, I have treated them poorly. You ever met somebody who's wild snobby though? And they're so far, well, I can't say that from the front. Right? But they are just, they're just snobby. And they look down their nose at you and they look down their nose at everybody else and nothing's good enough and nobody's good enough and nobody is quite like them. I remember growing up and it used to actually really annoy me because I'm not a big fan of cliches anymore. I used to be but I'm not anymore because cliches are cliches for a reason because they're overused. But my mum had a wee uh, placard on the mantelpiece. And, and actually it's so important for us as the people of God. And it simply said, never look down on someone unless you're helping them up. Right? Never look down on someone unless you're helping them up. And I think sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes subconsciously. And sometimes we know exactly what we're doing to look down 
our nose at people from a really high position of importance that we've placed upon ourselves. <laughs> Great Wesleyan theologian of old, W.T. Perkester, said this. He said that God respects purpose and he respects character, but he is unimpressed with status or with wealth. The point that James is illustrating to us here isn't that the wealthy don't need a saviour. It isn't that the wealthy are bad. It isn't that the wealthy are any less deserving of the love of a saviour than anybody else. Rather, the point that James is making is that he is writing to people who were treating the poor like dirt. He was writing to people who, in the name of Jesus, and in order to win and curry the favour of the rich, and those who maybe had a little bit more money to put into the offering basket, it probably wasn't an offering basket back then, but you know what I'm saying. He's writing to people who treated the poor like dirt in order that they might win the rich, so that they might have better social standard, that they might have more money to do the things that they want to do in the name of Jesus. And all the while they are compromising the gospel for which they stand. Jesus said that he had came to preach good news to the poor. Jesus said that he had came that he might preach good news to the poor. He instructs the church to care for the orphan and for the widow. And he's not saying don't care for the rich. He's not saying the rich will not inherit the kingdom of heaven because they have lots of money. Rather, what he is saying is this. He's saying everybody needs a saviour. And you can't buy your way in. And you've got to treat everybody the same. Because whilst, whilst there'll be some individuals in this room have more money than me, and whilst I'll have more money than some other individuals in this room, the scripture tells us that the great thing which unites us, and it's not that great a thing, but the thing which unites us all is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The thing that unites the poor and unites the rich is their need for a saviour. And James is not disputing this fact. He's not saying that the poor need a saviour and that the rich do not. Rather he's saying don't favour the rich in reaching them with the good news of the gospel over and at the expense of the poor. It's really easy to show preference, isn't it? It's really easy to show preference. It's so easy to see circumstances instead of seeing people. And it's so easy to see our own comfort instead of extending compassion. Today, we're wrestling with the question, what should I do when I like them better? And another way that we could have, um, could have phrased this is, what should I do when it's easier for me to tell them? What should I do when I like them better? Or what should I do when it's easier for me to tell them? Something which none of us are immune from. We all have different likes and dislikes, don't we? Yeah? We all support different teams and I wasn't here last Sunday and I'm sure that both Rosemary and Sam were very pleased that I wasn't. We support different teams and we cheer on different people and groups and we cheer them on to a different extent. Some of us are all in, some of us are almost obsessed and others of us are like, oh, wasn't it good that they won? You know, we all have our different likes and dislikes because the world would be boring if we were all the same, wouldn't it? 
Variety is the spice of life, I've been told. And our different personalities, our different likes and, and dislikes, they, they become a big part of who we are, don't they? And, and, and what we do, and they make us the individuals that, they are, that we are, and they help to form our personalities. And, and these things are not wrong in and of themselves. I'm not going to stand up here today and, using a football analogy, say that we all need to support Man United. Because we don't. Because it would be really boring if we all did. Because these things, these things are important in forming who we are. They are a part of who we are and our personality traits. They're not wrong in and of themselves. Because we have been created in the image of God. On purpose and for a purpose. On purpose and for a purpose. And in the same way that there's only one Sammy Robinson, there's only one Ida Jones. And in the same way there's only one Ida Jones, there's only one Ben Loyal. And in the same way there's only one Beverly McDowell and so on and so forth. And it's good and proper because we were wonderfully fearfully and wonderfully knit together in our mother's wombs and we were set apart and it's not it's it's not wrong to be individuals with different likes and different dislikes but what it is it's as though God through James is instructing and reminding us that no one is more important than anybody else no one is more important than anybody else. That mercy, kindness, compassion, the need for love and the need for a saviour is the great uniter and equaliser. That regardless of age, social class, creed or race, that anything contrary to that is contrary to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, if it plays out in our lives, is an outworking in our lives. Then we have become judges with evil thoughts. If we start to convince ourselves that some people are more important than other people when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to the right to forgiveness and the right for a saviour, we become, we are told, judges with evil thoughts thoughts who here today thinks they're an evil person nobody that's good that's good because that would have been a conversation for afterwards right <laughs> we don't like to think of ourselves in no sort of terms here but again the original hearers and readers they would have been more struck by this than we are sitting here you see james uses um, and he shows no hesitation in naming this kind of discrimination evil. And he uses the strongest term in the Greek language to describe what that is. He says you become judges with ponderous thoughts. And the word ponderous, which when translated from the Greek in, means to be malignantly evil. Malignantly evil in influence and effect what James is saying that favoritism or partiality is to our minds and our souls what cancer is to the body that's what he says in the original Greek that is how strongly not only he, but remember as he penned these words, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So by extension, this is how strongly God feels about us as the people of God showing favoritism, of showing partiality. And that's, that's a better pill, isn't it? There's just some silence around the room. And it's not an easy one to preach. And we have a, we have, it's lovely to have you with us today and we have a visitor with us and whenever I knew I was preaching this and I saw um, you sitting there, I thought, oh no. 
Because this one is straight and it's down the line and it's hot, it's a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. This is what God thinks of snobbery. This is what God thinks of favouritism and partiality. So what should we do when it comes creeping at the door? What should we do whenever we feel that tug? Whenever we feel the urge to take the easy option instead of the right option? I don't have the answer for you today. I'm not going to try and prescribe the answer to you today. But I am going to read the word of God to you today. You see, we're told... That one of the remedies is our character. It's our integrity. It's our character. We're told here, and James and Chloe read the passage for us in its entirety earlier. And we don't want to go and over it and over it and over it. But we're told in verses 5 to 7 here that God accepts the poor of this world who are rich in faith. I don't know about you, but I would rather have nothing, yet have Jesus, than have everything and not have Jesus. Do you remember the song that we used to sing? You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Gospels? What does it profit a man to gain the world, but lose his very soul? And God accepts the poor of this world who are rich in faith. Those with little of the world's good may still be rich in the favour of God. And we are told that whenever our faith is in God, even though we may have earth, in earthly terms have nothing, if our faith is in God, we are told that we are heirs of his kingdom. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, Paul writes to the Romans in chapter it. And James is writing this letter to the church and he's saying, guys, do you ever want to shake somebody? You can almost just feel him shaking them here and he's saying, guys, you have despised the very ones, despised the very ones that God has honoured. You have despised the very ones that God has honoured. And not only that, but we're also told that the Christians themselves were being persecuted by the very ones that they were showing preference to. Seems a wee bit strange, doesn't it? I don't know about you, and this is maybe not very pastoral to say from the front, but see, when somebody wrongs me, I'm not thinking, oh, I want to go give them a hug. Or, oh, I want to go and curry their favour. I would really like them to like me. You know, that's not what I'm thinking. It's not. And by the grace of God, I'm thankful that I don't act very often on the first thoughts that come to my mind. You see, the Christians were being persecuted in a way that we cannot appreciate and cannot understand because they gathered together in Jesus' name, because they worshipped God and God alone. They were being thrown into jail. They were being beaten. They were being uh, dragged through the courts. They were being made, in earthly terms, poor. Because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's as though James is going, do you not see the irony, folks? Do you not see the irony of what? is happening. It's also important, and I feel that it is important to say this, that just because people are rich doesn't mean they can't be followers of Jesus. The scripture is actually full of people who are rich and are followers of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, who was wealthy enough to spare a tomb that Jesus' body may be laid in it. Barnabas, who journeyed with Paul 
was from a rich heritage. Lydia was a seller of purple cloth. She basically owned the early church's Prada, right? She was a wealthy woman. Aquila and Priscilla, wealthy people. Philemon, who had slaves in those days, and that was an indication of wealth. Wealthy people had accepted Christ. And there's nothing wrong with the rich. But similarly, there's nothing wrong with the poor. Our gospel that we proclaim must be, must be a one-size-fits-all gospel. That's what James is saying, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And we are told that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've gone way off my notes today. But that's okay. And that's fine. Because sometimes the spirit moves in this way and he just says, just drill home point one. Just drill home point one. Doesn't matter who you come across this week. As we heard from from Dave a little bit later on, Dave's week will look different than my week. And my week will look different than your week. But we're all going to come across people in some way, shape or form. Individuals who regardless of their social class, and regardless of their race, and regardless of what they currently believe, and regardless of how they treat other people, Regardless of so many different factors, one thing is true about everyone, me and you included. We are in need of a saviour. We are in need of a saviour. And we know who that saviour is. The one who laid down his life, Jesus Christ, so that you and I could know freedom. And so that those with whom we come in contact with this week, that they may also know freedom. So indiscriminately share the indiscriminate message of hope. Indiscriminately share the indiscriminate message of hope. That Jesus Christ came into the world that we might know freedom. That everything that we are looking for, everything that we've ever looked for, and everything that we ever will look for is found in the person of the resurrected Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world, the hope of the nations. There is no other way to the Father except through him. And it was he who formed us, and it is he who calls us, and it is he who calls each and every individual whom we come in contact with this week and beyond. So, My brothers and sisters, believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, do not show favoritism, but indiscriminately share the indiscriminate message of hope. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together as the band come to lead us in worship.